Hi everyone and welcome to this evening's presentation. My name is Daisy. I'm with the SNHU Career Services and I'm joined today by Jen who will be in the chat uh, throughout the session and then Gary with the Department of Labor who will be our presenter here in a couple minutes. I'm just going to go through some brief housekeeping. As an FYI, if you do need to enable live captioning, you can do so using that more button at the top of your screen. Instructions are on the screen, but you'll just click more and you'll go into language and speech options. And again, as a note, the session is being recorded and it will be uploaded to YouTube shortly. I also want to know about our accessibility statement. Individuals with accessibility needs requiring accommodations may reach out to, if you're an online student, it will be OAC at snhu.edu, or you can call at 866-305-9430. If you're a campus student, you can email CAC at snhu.edu, or you can call 630. Excuse me, 603-644-3118. If you are SNHU staff or faculty, you can email hr at snhu.edu. And just so you know, a request for live captioning or live ASL interpreting requires at least three weeks advance notice. Finally, I encourage you to connect with the SNHU Career Services. We are on all the social media platforms and as well with our website. This also has our contact information. It is a lifelong service for you as students and alumni, and I, I'm biased, but we're a really, really great team. So I think if you want to connect with us, this is how you can do so. With that, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing, and I will go ahead and turn it over to our presenter and our speaker this evening, Gary. Thank you so much, Daisy. Um, for the intro, can you just confirm you can see my slides again? I can, absolutely. Perfect, thank you. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Gary Kuczynski. I use he, him, his pronouns. And I'm a member of the Recruitment and Outreach Branch within the US Department of Labor's Office of Resources. I am going to take some time to talk about the career opportunities within the Department of Labor and hopefully um, provide some insight about what we have to offer here. Uh, to ensure we are accessible, we always like to kind of highlight who, what we look like in these sessions. So I'm a white male. Uh, I have brown hair. I'm wearing a blue shirt with a maroon tie on today. Throughout the sessions, you can drop them uh, any questions in the chat. And then at the end of the session, we should have some time to address them. Our agenda for today is going to be talking about the role in the mission of the Department of Labor. We're going to highlight some of our career opportunities, the agencies that make up our department, as well as the sampling of jobs that we have available. Uh, I'll also kind of touch on some benefits of employment and then some hiring paths you might want to be considered for. And then we'll end with those questions, as I said. So when we talk about the Department of Labor, we focus on the role and the mission of the department. The Department of Labor administers and enforces more than 180 federal laws for about 150 million workers in 10 million workplaces. When we highlight our mission, it is really to foster, promote, and develop the welfare of the wage earners, uh, job seekers, and retirees in the United States. So no matter where someone is in the job market, we are there to support them, whether they're looking for a job for the first time, looking for new opportunities and training, currently employed, or they're getting ready to retire. The U.S. Department of Labor is really there to support them. We want to improve the working conditions of uh, workers, advance opportunities for profitable employment, and ensure work-related benefits are met. Overall, we're really here to kind of make sure that individuals have access to those good jobs for all Americans. We also think it's really important that you know your, about your rights as a worker, and you can always go to worker.gov to learn more about those rights um, you have as an employee and understand them. If you think your rights are being violated, there's lots of information as well for you to reach out to federal agencies to get support uh, about your um, any violations you feel like you're, are being met. So what are career opportunities at the Department of Labor? The roles and positions across our department really vary. Some roles are gonna be focused on enforcement, so they're enforcing federal regulations and laws. Some of those positions that we have in our department are really gonna be focused on policy and uh, looking at and, and interpreting different federal regulations, laws, and executive orders. Some of our positions are going to be focused on administering programs and grants that the department provides for community organizations and states. So making sure that those organizations in their state are in compliance with the grants requirements. We have positions that are focused on um, some legal aspects. They could be paralegals, law clerks, attorneys within our department. We have a number of positions that are going to be focused on data evaluation, statistical analysis, economic positions, all looking at providing information about the U.S. labor market 
providing information about the work that we're doing here at the Department of Labor and how we can do things more effectively. And finally, we have a number of staff um, who are really here just to keep our department running. I'm one of their staff members. I'm not out in the field kind of supporting our American workers directly, but the work that I do every day is really to make sure that our department, our agency is functioning. Making sure that we have good employees and good staff who can do the jobs and uh, support our American workers. So there's roles could be IT related, they could be HR related, accounting, finance, and there's lots of stuff um, that staff in our department are doing just to make sure we're functioning every day. We also understand that we have to have offices where the American workers are. So that means we have offices across the entire United States. Our headquarters is based in Washington, D.C., but we have regional offices in Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Atlanta, Chicago, Dallas, and San Francisco. Outside those regional offices, we also have district and area offices that ensure that we have staff close to where the workers are working. We also understand we need to have workers from here at Department of Labor from a variety of different backgrounds and experiences to match the United States workers. We want to make a we want a labor force in our department that reflects the American workers and diversity that comes with them. By bringing together people from a variety of different backgrounds and experiences, we know we can do the best job for the American workers. When you think of the Department of Labor, you may not really understand all the agencies that make up our department. We have 25 plus different agencies that carry out the mission and focus of the Department of Labor in their own unique way. So you may be familiar with some of our agencies like the Occupational Safety Health Administration or Wage and Hour Division, but there may be many others that you're not aware of. So lots of our agencies um, really have their own unique mission. So the Occupational Safety Health Administration, Wage and Hour Division, our Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, our Mine Safety Health Administration, our Office of Labor Management Standards. There are all different agencies that have an enforcement component to them. So they're going out and enforcing federal regulations and making sure that the area that they're um, tasked with enforcing and kind of following up on is meeting the requirements. So that could be employers, that could be labor unions. There's lots of different areas that kind of fall into that areas. We also have areas that um, agencies that are focused on particular policy areas and um, supporting work in that particular area. So our Office of Disability Employment Policy, our, our Women's Bureau, our Veterans Employment Trading Service, they provide resources for subsect, uh, subsections of the uh, workforce in the United States and making sure that there's um, resources available for those um, employers as well as those workers who fall into those categories. We also have a number of different areas that are focused on really unique areas and focuses. So our Bureau of International Labor Affairs, they're looking at international labor rights and um, practices. So making sure that labor rights are factored into trade regulations, making sure that human trafficking and child trafficking abroad is focused on, making sure that we're focused, looking at economic development in different areas of the world as well. Our Office of Workers' Compensation Programs provides workers' compensation insurance for federal employees, um, Longshore uh, members, um, black lung participants, so there's individuals who um, were damaged, uh, infected by um, coal mines, um, individuals who are energy workers, providing the compensation that they need if they can't go back to work or they're out um, because of a workplace related injury. We have areas that are focused on those legal aspects, so the Office of Solicitor, our Administrative Review Board, Benefits Review, or, uh, Employees Compensation Review Board, Administrative Law Judges, all different areas that have that legal component to the work that they're doing. And then we have other sub areas that are kind of looking at um, that data and statistical analysis area. So Bureau of Labor Statistics, or Office of Assistant Secretary of Policy, really are looking at kind of supporting um, and providing data out there, whether it's um, to the general public or to Department of Labor agencies about the work we're doing. On the screen here, we do have a sampling of our job opportunities as well that we typically hire for that make up our department. So it's a wide variety of ranges as well. So accountants and auditors, contract specialists, economists, equal opportunity specialists, workforce development specialists, investigators, HR staff members, program analysts. Um, someone asked earlier in, in the previous session about um, data scientists, and we do hire data science individuals. We have international relations specialists. So there's a wide variety of our careers within our department that support the work that we're doing and the missions of our agencies. 
we do always like to highlight the benefits of working for the Department of Labor as well. So one of the things you're frequently hear from our staff is really the public service nature of the work that we're doing. So when we're talking to um, our staff here in the department, what gets them up every day and what really kind of is passionate about the work they're doing is really the ability to kind of impact American workers. So that's a variety of different ways that they do that, whether that's enforcing um, federal regulations, making sure employees are being paid and compensated for the work they're doing, making sure that their employers aren't taking advantage of them, making sure that they um, the, that employees have access to training. So that could be just administering a grant to a uh, community organization that's providing training for a certain community. Um, so there's lots of um, ways that our staff really are passionate about the work they're doing, about the public service nature of our, uh, of our work here in the Department of Labor. There's also some benefits that we have that are eligible for across a lot of federal agencies. So there's health care insurance, so medical, dental, and vision insurance that's provided to employees. Um, there's also going to be life insurance that's available for employees to use as well. There's going to be retirement available. Um, within the federal space, the retirement is really a three-legged stool, so how we, um, the Office of Personal Management likes to consider it. So there's Social Security is one part of that. The Thrift Savings Plan, which is a 401k-like program that has an agency match um, available to federal employees. And there's going to be the federal employees retirement um, system, which is going to be the pension system for federal employees that factors in um, a period uh, an employee's length of service, as well as their high through salary, which will give them a pension when they go to retire. Um, so you can have that for the rest of your life, which is a great resource. We also have a lot of work-life balance flexibilities here in the Department of Labor. So there is the ability to kind of have a, a flexible or unique work schedules. So some staff um, in my department, they actually will work four days a week. So they work um, four 10 hour days a week. Um, and so they have an extra day off to kind of enjoy an extended weekend every week. Some of our staff also kind of will start and end their schedule, uh, the work day that kind of work best for them. So there are staff who will start at six o'clock in the morning and they're end their day at um, 3, 3.30 in the afternoon. Um, so that they have the ability to kind of pick up their child from school or they can participate in after school activities with their children or take care of a loved one, a parent, um, sibling, and something of that nature. Um, or they can just, you know, enjoy their evening. They can go out and visit friends or travel or stuff of that nature. So there's lots of great work-life balance available to employees. We also have excellent advancement opportunities, so a lot of our positions will have actually promotion potential built into them. So you could start in a lower graded position um, using just your education and kind of work your way up in that role. So you're advancing in that position just by doing the job, um, your job, doing it well and, and kind of um, showing your supervisor that you can kind of advance and you can have the ability to be promoted in, um, in that role. There's also going to be lots of training professional development available to employees. So that's going to be available in terms of the agency. So agencies are going to train you in terms of what the work, the work they're doing is. They're going to train you on your actual job that you're going to be doing and make sure you're familiar with the regulations associated with it. But then there's also going to be training that's provided by the Office of Human Resources. So that could be different workshops we're hosting. So that could be a session on continuing learning. Um, we've done sessions on um, the resume, how to interview, um, how to read USA jobs announcements. There could also be opportunities for you to kind of take our learning management system and kind of learn soft skills. So there could be um, information sessions about um, time management, how to coordinate and kind of work under different en environments and kind of how to manage if you're in a supervisory position. So there's lots of opportunity for training professional development. And there's also going to be opportunities for competitive uh, pay and leave. So in terms of that competitive pay, um, our salaries are based off the GS schedule, which looks at the locality of where an employee is working, so kind of factoring that into what a pay scale looks like. And then there's going to be um, our annual leave and sick leave that's provided to employees. The annual leave that's going to be provided is also going to be factored in the base of how many years of service you have. So the longer you work within the federal government, the additional leaves that you will have available to you. When we talk about our career opportunities at the Department of Labor, you um, can always find our jobs in usajobs.gov. So usajobs.gov is going to be the federal um, employment website, really, um, where you can see lots of opportunities across all federal agencies. But um, if you're looking for Department of Labor specific careers, you can start on the homepage on usajobs.gov, type in Department of Labor, and look at those career opportunities in there. Um, if you have a profile created, you can save that search to your profile. You can upload your resume, make your resume searchable so that HR staff like myself are able to kind of view your resume and your information in the system. And you can learn, um, set up your hiring paths as well. 
is you're not as familiar with USA Jobs. You don't have a profile creating created already. There's lots of information as well on USAjobs.gov about helpful resources and tips about the process and how to create your profile. Um, I always encourage individuals to kind of take some time to look at the website and kind of learn more about USA Jobs on there. There's also lots of events that are hosted there as well. So across federal agencies, we're always hosting information sessions and um, events to kind of talk about USAjobs.gov, how to read a job announcement, the federal resume, because it is a little bit unique. Um, how to interview, we're talking about our different agencies who so always go out and kind of learn and kind of attend their sessions um, just to learn more about, you know, what the process and kind of how to make sure you're a great candidate for those positions you're applying for. I do want to take some time to kind of highlight some of those hiring paths that's available. So we do participate in the federal government's pathways program. So that means we have paid internships available and recent graduate opportunities available. There's paid interns that you have to be currently enrolled um, at least half time to be considered for those positions and they're going to be posted on USAjobs.gov. We also have recent graduates. So those are one year appointments. They are paid as well. Um, both the um, pathways um, interns, the paid interns and the recent graduates are going to be posted on USAjobs.gov and have the ability to be converted to a permanent position if you are successfully completing the program, you're doing everything that you need to do for your position. We also participate in the Pathways Presidential Management Fellows Program, so anyone who has an advanced degree, so a PhD or a master's level degree, um, or you're planning to go off to get a master's or PhD in the future, you can be considered for the Presidential Management Fellows Program. It is a two-year program, so unlike the recent graduate one, it's one year, the Presidential Management Fellows Program is two years. There's also going to be rotation as part of that program, and it's a very highly competitive uh, leadership development program. So it's going to be the application process. There's going to be some interviews. There could be a writing sample. There's a lot of information that's part of that program. Um, but it is a really great program to become part of and kind of considered for. Um, typically, OPM makes that announcement available in um, September, so you'd want to apply for it um, your prior year in terms of graduating with your degree. After completing the degree, you have um, the ability to kind of um, be in that two-year program, and then you're able to um, be hired permanently if there's um, space available and you are successfully completing the program um, after that two-year period. Department of Labor also offers our volunteer internship program as well. So that's an opportunity to kind of understand what federal service is, see if federal service is something that interests you um, as an experiential learning opportunity while you're still in school. Our program here at Department of Labor requires either an external grant slash stipend um, that equals $15 an hour or the minimum wage you're working in, or we're receiving course credit for that period of service. There's also opportunities for those with disabilities. So that could be through the Schedule A hiring process um, that makes um, a little bit easier for those who have disabilities to get into federal service. In order to do that, you need to get have a Schedule A letter created. Um, so typically what that is, it's going to be asking a letter from a licensed medical professional, of, um, certified vocational rehabilitation professional, or any federal or state agency um, that provides disability benefits. So it would have to be on the letterhead. Um, and it would have to basically state that you have an intellectual disability, a severe psych, um, physical disability, or a psychiatric disability. That letter does not need to state what the disability actually is. It doesn't have to state your medical, uh, your medical history or any accommodations you need. It really just needs to state that you have um, one a disability. Once you have that letter, you can apply to jobs. So that could be through USA Jobs if we're an announcement that has a position open to those who have a disability through the Schedule A process. It could also be working directly with the agency. So here at Department of Labor, our dis, um, diversity and inclusion dash public at d1.gov is the contact for anyone who wants to be considered through the Schedule A process. And then finally, we have opportunities for veterans and military spouses. So we always like to thank um, both the veterans and military spouses for their sacrifices for our country. Um, there are going to be opportunities for veterans to get additional preference in their hiring process as they apply for federal jobs. So it's a case by case situation that you want to make sure you have your veterans documentation available and see what preference el you're eligible for. Um, there's also going to be special hiring authorities available for veterans as well that can allow you to apply non competitively to an announcement. Um, so that's something else to consider for be considering kind of look up um, into information about both these um, all, all these hiring authorities are available in usajobs.gov as well. And then finally, there's going to be information for those who have uh, are military spouses because there's going to be non competitive hiring authorities for those too. So you don't have to apply to an open to the public announcement. You can still apply for them if you're a military spouse, but you can apply to some announcements non competitively as well to be considered for federal service.
So that's everything I have um, in terms of presenting. Now we can kind of go through any kind of questions that's available. On the screen here, we do have two QR codes though. The top QR code will bring you up to our uh, weekly email that we send out, a, a subscription form that will highlight job opportunities and events we host. Um, there's also a, a QR code on the screen that will bring you up to the social media accounts for the Department of Labor. So you can kind of follow our, our agencies if you're interested in them. And then you can always get more information about our department on dol.gov slash careers um, or reach out to us our recruitment team here at dol-recruitment at d1.gov. So that is everything. We can go to questions now. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm going to selfishly start with a question that really intrigued me. So the question is, are roles within the Department of Labor vulnerable to term changes in regards to political offices? So that's a great question. Um, so it's going to... Across federal service, um, a majority of our staff are going to be competitive um, service employees. So that means we're basically tenured um, in our roles. Um, if you are on a, or an, appointed to a political position, um, then you can be affected based off um, political changes and stuff of that nature. But a majority of our roles are going to be consistent for our um, department, depending on whatever the administration is. So across my team, um, I have staff who uh, colleagues who have worked um, across several administrations, several presidents of both parties. Um, so no matter whose uh, administration is, um, that doesn't necessarily change the roles. Um, some of the areas of focus may shift a little bit. So some of the areas in policy may shift with executive orders or what's passed by Congress um, in terms of those laws. But for the most part, roles particularly are gonna um, stay the same. Perfect, that's a great answer, thank you. And could you speak to any remote job opportunities with the Department of Labor? So positions are going to be posted on USA Jobs depending on kind of where they are. Um, within our department, one of the, um, there are the eligibilities for P, uh, opportunities for um, jobs to be posted remotely. Um, it just varies from position to position. One uh, opportunity that I know is frequently posted remotely and has the ability to kind of get continued that way um, is our workers' compensation claims examiners. And um, they're within our office workers' compensation program. So they're the, um, those claims examiners are the ones working directly with um, the claimants um, to process kind of information, get medical information, and make sure that they're getting um, their payment for the medical bills or um, wage replacement, anything of that nature. So they're, they um, switched to being remote during the pandemic, um, and they've been very successful in the work they're doing. So they're staying remote um, in that position. Perfect, thank you. And could you give us recommendations on how a candidate could stand out when they're applying? I know the federal resume process is, we've mm -hmm. got some questions on that as well, but are there ways to really stand out as part of that process? So when you're talking about um, applying to a federal position, it's really kind of gonna start with understanding and reading the job announcement. Um, when you're looking at that, your resume is gonna be the most important piece of that application process, because that's the one part that the HR staff member can um, really kind of highlight and kind of connect with your qualifications. And that's going to be the biggest piece. So the way federal hiring kind of works is HR initially does um, a review of candidates for eligibility. So are they eligible for the position? And then they review the resume based on qualifications and they're going to make a determination about um, whether someone's qualified and kind of how they fall into that. In each job announcement, the how you will be evaluated section, we'll kind of talk about how individuals are ranked, um, are gonna be evaluated based on those qualifications. That's important to kind of look at and consider. But once individuals are reviewed, um, then only the top tier candidates are typically sent over to the hiring managers. And then the hiring managers are gonna make the decision about interviews. So you're going through multiple layers of review process. So when you're creating your resume, you want to make sure that an HR staff member who doesn't have an understanding of kind of the work you're doing day to day really understands kind of what you're going to be doing, as well as the hiring manager. Um, things that people can add to the resume that they may not already consider um, is could be volunteer experience, unpaid work experience. So if you're a student leader, anything of that nature, add that to your resume, add the work that you're doing, um, whether it's communication, if you're or event planning or something of that nature as a student leader, those are important skills to add in there. And then you can also add any kind of lived experience as well in there. Um, so lived experience is a more unique experience um, opportunity that we're kind of highlighting at Department of Labor, where we're thinking of those non-formal training opportunities. So it could be um, firsthand knowledge of like a, a policy or an issue for a particular community. So an example could be like if you were um, in the service industry and you're supervising um, 
where you were working was um, forcing you to work unpaid overtime and you were filed a complaint or someone in your team uh, your team um, filed a complaint with the wage and hour division they did an investigation and you kind of so helped support that investigation with interviews and kind of understood more about the wage and hour laws and the fair labor standards um, act based on that interaction that could be something important to add to your resume so that the hiring manager can kind of see that you're interested in that work um, your experience with that work as well and that could be a, a great reason to show that you're passionate about the work that you're doing and the job you're applying to I love that. I've never heard the lived experiences before. So that's a really interesting perspective. Yep. You might have alluded to it with the qualifications, but we had a question come in about if you were in a graduate program without opening up to positions that were a bit beyond entry level, would that fall under that qualifications category? Yes, in the qualifications, it'll list in terms of what um, any kind of degree that you could use to qualify. So typically within federal service, um, you can qualify for a GS-5 position with a bachelor's degree, a GS-7 position with a, a superior academic achievement with a bachelor's degree. So that's at least a 3.0 overall, 3.5 in your major or academic um, or honor society membership, or a year's worth of graduate experience that can get you a um, a um, GS-7. A GS-9 could be eligible if you have a master's degree. So if you're graduating with a master's degree, you can apply, uh, you can be qualified for those positions. And then if you're doing advanced work, PhD or anything of that nature, um, you can, um, the GS-11 position could be eligible for you. Perfect, okay. And there was another question if uh, there are any age preferences on these positions. So there's not going to be any kind of age restrictions or anything of that nature. So across a variety of different experience levels and age ranges, individuals can um, be considered. The only opportunity where there may be an age restriction could be um, typically we're, um, for individuals who are, are, are too young to kind of do some of the work. Um, but um, that's going to be the only time. And they'll list that in the announcement if that's an eligible uh, required um, for an announcement. Okay, fantastic. And then Let's see, we had a couple of questions that were program specific. So, I mean, just to throw a couple out, there was chemistry, cybersecurity, HR, project management. So, I believe you said it already, but can you maybe speak a bit more about what kind of majors might be applicable for different roles? Yeah, so I just dropped in a website that we have on our um that kind of turns uh, education and experience into a career department of labor, which can be helpful um, for individuals to kind of see and kind of think about, okay, I have a degree in this, what can I do uh, as some career opportunities? It doesn't necessarily mean that you, you're restricted to those things. So someone who is in, um, chemistry, so uh, physical science, something of that nature, they may want to, they could do industrial hygiene, they could be a, a workers compensation claims examiner, they could do um, HR if they wanted to, they said I, you know, I took chemistry, I wasn't a huge fan of chemistry, I have a degree in it, but I don't want to do this, and they want to work in HR. Um, that could also be very um, applicable. So there's lots of opportunities, the website can connect individuals with um, some suggestions based on what we've seen in the past, but always look at that job announcement to kind of see if there's a requirement for that. Perfect. We've got a minute left. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Is there anything that you feel like we haven't asked or you haven't covered that you wanted to make sure got included in this uh, presentation this evening? I think the biggest thing is always make sure that you're looking at the job announcement um, when applying to a federal position and you're looking at those qualifications um, and understanding that you need to, need to clearly make sure you're aligning those qualifications on your resume. Um, and then a lot of the announcements will also have a, a sample questionnaire um, somewhere in the announcement. Make sure you're looking at the sample questionnaire and thinking about how you're going to answer those questions and make sure your resume also supports those answers as well. So if you're saying that you are an expert at communication because the questionnaire asked about that, but you don't mention communication anywhere on your resume, that's going to be a, a big disconnect. So you want to make sure you're backing up those responses as well. Perfect. So I see we have questions in the chat that we haven't been able to get to, so we will do our best to follow up with those. But again, a reminder that these recordings will be on YouTube in a couple of days, so you're also welcome to follow up that way as well. But we are at the end of the session, so Gary, I would say yet again, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. It's been, I've learned a lot, uh, which is always nice to to do so. So we appreciate your time and the content you shared with us today. Thank you so much. Perfect. Awesome. Well then, yeah, that is the end of the session. So everyone, please, you're welcome to go about your afternoon. And again, we'll be following up 
probably tomorrow, if not Friday, with some follow-up information, including the YouTube link. So thank you again to everyone. Have a good night. Take care, everyone. Bye. Yeah, thank you, Gary.